we started talking about support vector machines. And at the very heart of these SVMs is something called quadratic programming. Quadratic programming is a standard class of um, optimization problems. And there's a corresponding algorithm to solve these problems, uh, assuming we can get them into uh, the correct form. The problem definition is that there's an objective function that we're trying to minimize. It has both quadratic and linear components. We can also have a mixture of quadratic and linear terms. But in, in minimizing this objective function, we also have to satisfy a set of constraints. These constraints are expressed in terms of a set of inequalities. The algorithm itself engages in a search where it has to decide for the constraints whether uh, they satisfy the, the equality uh, precisely or whether they are unequal in the, say, the greater than sense. Um, but we never uh, allow a scenario where we have the, the less than uh, sense. Within those binary choices, the algorithm then has to figure out what uh, parameters to uh, actually uh, choose in order to minimize this objective function. And it, it actually engages in an incremental search where it's trying out different combinations of these binary decisions about constraints and, and then figuring out what parameters are, are most appropriate and until finally it reaches a, a, a place where uh, it has uh, optimized the objective function. Quadratic programming solvers exist in most serious mathematical toolboxes and NumPy is, is one of those. And in fact, it's the NumPy implementation that's used within Scikit-Learn. In order to use them, though, one has to take your optimization problem and transform them into a, a standard form. So let's talk a little bit about that standard form and then show how the support vector machines uh, do that mapping. All right, within quadratic programming, we have some number of variables that we can select. We have NP uh, variables. Uh, to be chosen by the algorithm. And then we also have some number of constraints. We'll call that uh, NC. And this is consistent with how the book defines things. And then uh, on top of this, then we also have an objective function. And this objective function is defined over uh, the set of uh, variables. Let me write out the objective function and, and constraint terms that the book presents, and then we'll talk about what they uh, actually mean. So our objective function looks like this. So we're going to try to minimize by selecting our parameters p. We're trying to minimize uh, an objective function of this form, 1 half p transpose h p plus f t p. All right, so, so h, h and uh, f here are constants. H is a matrix, F is a vector. And those are part of the problem definition itself. And then let's talk about the other piece, which is uh, the constraints. So we're going to minimize this objective function subject to uh, the constraints. And the, the compact way of writing this is A, P is less than B here. So in this equation, A is a matrix and B is a vector. So H and A are, are matrices. Uh, this, this equation here defines not just uh, one constraint, but actually it defines a total of uh, NC constraints. So first let's talk about the uh, objective function here. In scalar form, this is equal to the following. So it's a sum over the parameters 
And in fact, it's a double sum over the parameters. And it's pi times pj times hij. And if it isn't clear, this is our this is a quadratic term here. The other piece is just a row vector multiplied by a column vector. So this is just a single sum. And that's fi times pi. OK, so, so this is our quadratic term here for our objective function. This is our linear term for our objective function. Uh, this piece here allows us to express things like uh, p1 squared and uh, say a times p1 squared. That A is captured in the H matrix. We can also have terms like uh, P2 times P3. So those are our cross terms. And again, there's some sort of a constant that, that comes in from the H matrix. So this is a very general formulation here. For the right-hand side, this allows us to capture things like A uh, P1 plus uh, B P2, et cetera. So I'm going to write uh, for every i, and i runs from 0 to nc minus 1. And we're going to take a sum over all of the parameters. So 0 to np minus 1. And it's a sum, a weighted sum of the parameters p, aij times pj. And this sum here has to be less than or equal to B I. So the A matrix itself, uh, this is a, it has uh, N C rows by N P columns. So whenever we're setting up quadratic programming uh, in order to solve some specific optimization problem, we get to choose as practitioners what this set of variables uh, is. This, is. this is just our choice. They're constants, they're not going to be changing. And then the job of the quadratic programming function then is to figure out what p's to choose that satisfy the constraints and also minimize the objective function. So let's see now how we can do this for our support vector machine scenario. All right, so what I have here on the left-hand side is our standard form for quadratic programming. And on the right-hand side is our optimization process, as we talked about, for support vector machines in the classification domain. What we want to do is show that we can transform the SVM problem over to uh, QP. Within this W here, um, so first off, the support vector machines, we're optimizing uh, over a vector W and a, a scalar B. And, the, uh, and, and then those are all of the parameters that we have available to us. So uh, in this case, um, the P on the right hand side, on the left hand side is, is equal to our set of Ws, W0, W1 to W n minus one, and then B tacked on to the very end. In order to get this, this cost function translated over to the standard form, there are a couple things to notice. First off, there are no linear terms here. It's all quadratic terms. So what this tells us is that uh, f is equal to 0. And I'm just going to write 0 with the arrow on top, meaning it's a vector of just zeros. And h, one thing to notice here is that uh, all of the W's appear on this side, but B does not, uh, does not appear within the optimization problem. So H is, it's a, essentially an identity matrix. So it has uh, zeros off the diagonal and ones down the diagonal, except the very last entry is, uh, is zero, and that corresponds to the, the B term. And then all of the other terms within this H matrix are zeros. Once we've defined this F and this H, then 
we have a match now between the the cost function that we've defined uh, over on the F SVM side and the cost function on the QP side. Okay, so next we need to work on our constraints. And I've left our constraints in, in, uh, in a form where we've separated the positive examples from the negative examples, just to make it a little bit more clear. The, the total number of constraints that we have on the on the right hand side, the posit positive constraints uh, plus the negative constraints equals the total number of constraints that we have on the left hand side. And, and if it isn't obvious, we have one constraint for every single training sample here. So let's, let's do a little bit of algebra, transform this particular uh, inequality into uh, a standard form. So first off, I want to, uh, to work on this. We can multiply both sides by negative one in order to do that. And in order to take the next step, it's all about selecting what W is and what B is. In order to get th this pair of parameters into standard form, what I wanna do is start referencing P here but then the question is, what is uh, xj? So remember that x is the set of features, the vector of features that are coming in for the jth example. I'm going to augment that uh, by defining, uh, let's call it xj hat. And that's going to be equal to all of the components of uh, of xj, so xj0, xj1, uh, et cetera, down to xj, and this is n minus one. And then the last element here is just a, a one. And once I define things in this way, I can collapse these two pieces uh, together. I should say I did make a small error in that transformation. This should be a negative b right there. I can, I can rewrite this, this uh, left-hand side of the inequality now uh, in this way. I can say minus P transpose XJ hat is less than or equal to, wow, well, I'm missing a negative one there too. So less than or equal to uh, negative one. Because this result here is a, a, a scalar form, the, the result of that, that product is a scalar, I can actually reorder the, the two elements here arbitrarily. So I can translate this into x j hat with a negative sign there, uh, transpose p. So by defining this xj hat in this way uh, and acknowledging that I have uh, a scalar result of multiplying this, uh, these two vectors together, I, I can reorder things uh, such that I have things in now in this form here. Now we can compare this uh, form here directly to what we have uh, over here. So this piece here expresses that uh, product of the two vectors um, where the aij's here capture the the x j hats minus, and the b i is uh, negative one here. We can do the same uh, down below. So I can rewrite uh, for the negative examples, I can rewrite this term here by uh, in, in this way, so I have a w hat. Sorry, it's not a w hat, it is a p transpose xj hat, and that's less than or equal to negative one. Again, because the result here is a scalar, I can reorder that arbitrarily, so that's xj hat transpose p, and that's less than or equal to negative one. And now I have a form that's directly comparable to the standard form. And, and again, the AIJs are 
uh, in, encode the input sample. All right, so now we've transformed our support vector machine formulation into the standard QP form. And, in, and at this point, uh, what we can do is, is hand our problem off to a, a standard QP solver, and it will go off and uh, do its job. So next up, we're going to start talking about the next uh, pieces of support vector machines. And in particular, uh, we want to start talking about nonlinear transformations that are possible. Okay, let's come back around to uh, the constraints. Uh, what we just derived was for the positive cases, we have this uh, scenario where we are multiplying XJ transpose, actually it's XJ hat transpose. And there's a negative in there, transpose P. Uh, and it, it can either be equal to negative one or XG hat transpose P is strictly less than negative one. So that's an or. For the negative cases, what we derived was XJ hat transpose P is equal to negative one or XJ hat transpose P is strictly less than negative one. And it's not XG, it is XJ. All right, so, so this, it, it, this set includes all of our training elements. And for these two cases here, where we have the strictly equals uh, scenario. These are samples that are right on the margin. And these elements here are samples that are far outside the margin. And, and by far outside the margin, I mean that we're on the correct uh, side uh, of the margin, not the, uh, the incorrect side. So the, the point that I wanted to make here was that if we were to, say, move the points around, so if I, if I took an XJ from over here on the right-hand side, if I took that and moved it around a little bit, that's presumably we're still within that region that's that's on the correct side of the margin. That that's not going to actually change what our choices are as far as our W hats. Or in in this, I guess, in the way I've written it is it's uh, in terms of our uh, our p uh, variables here. And and on the other side of the the coin are the points that actually sit right on the margin. If I were to uh, pick one of those points up and, and move it around a little bit, it's going to do one of two things. Either it's going to uh, change the location of the margin. If I move this point closer to the uh, to the decision boundary, then, then the margin is necessarily going to shrink some. Uh, if I move it away, the margin is going to increase uh, up to a point. It, it It might get to a point where it's not no longer on the margin, but is far uh, inside the, the margin. But if I'm making very tiny changes, moving these points that are on the margin around means that the margin is going to be changing. So, so the point of the story is that what defines the, the margin and hence the uh, decision boundary is completely determined by the points on the left-hand side here. And the, the points on the right-hand side don't really uh, matter. And, and in fact, uh, what we can uh, do, once we've gone through the learning process of figuring out which points are which, we can represent the decision function entirely in terms of these left-hand points. And these are what we refer to as our support vectors. 
because they're the ones that support that decision boundary. And, and the other points, we could move them around, we can throw them away, uh, it, it doesn't matter. And so the implication of this is that when we're actually querying this model that we've now learned, we don't actually have to ask all of the points in the training set. We can only ask, we only need to ask the, the points that are on the, the decision boundary, the, the support vectors. And, and so uh, this enables us to potentially be relatively efficient about, uh, about how we answer uh, these queries. However, we still have to uh, touch a, perhaps a, a fair number of training samples in order to answer an individual query. And, and this is one of the, the downsides of support vector machines. As the dimensionality of the, the system gets bigger and the training set gets bigger, the number of the absolute number of support vectors tends to get bigger as well, and it gets more and more expensive to query the decision boundary. Whereas in the, the linear decision boundaries that we studied a few weeks ago, the model is entirely summarized in terms of a weight vector. And, and, uh, and so a query is just a simple inner product between that weight vector and our input features. So this is one of the downsides of support vector machines. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, nonlinearities, and and that's going to get us to uh, one of the big wins with support vector machines. So that's up next. <laughs>